Well, I'm glad you could join me for the hour and a few times a year I like to have on air Leo Homan. He is the author of the book Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. By the way, you know by now that I live in the land of mass migration, Minnesota, and that's both the Twin Cities and outstate Minnesota. And we have some challenges here. And some of those challenges, well, they'd be conquered if our migrants here would assimilate, but that doesn't seem to happen. We're going to talk about a lot of issues today. We'll talk about some of that stealth invasion. But I've got some other issues too. How about the uh, burning of Notre Dame? Does that have some significance? We're going to talk about just a lot of issues here in the hour ahead. Leo Holman, welcome back to Understanding the Times Radio. Thanks for having me on, Jan. Yeah, listen, just a couple of introductory comments, but my comments here are going to be in the form of a question. I'm quoting you here, and you say, the process of settlement is a civilization jihad process with all that the word means. The brothers must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and then the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. First of all, that is from the Muslim Brotherhood. Am I right there? That's who the reference to the brothers is pretending to, exactly, the Muslim Brotherhood, founded in 1928. Okay, so a couple of comments here, because we've got some representatives in Congress that uh, just are a little bit troubling. I've referenced them on air before, and we can call them out by name here eventually. Nancy Pelosi removed, I think, personally, all doubt as to who is really in control on Capitol Hill. It's not, say, the old line Democrats, the liberals. It is the new breed of Democrat, the so-called progressives, who now call the shots. We are seeing nothing less than the convergence of the red-green axis right before our eyes. I'm quoting you, Leo, and then you go on to say, red, which is Marxist ideology, and green, which is Islamic ideology, coming together for a complete and total transformation of America. How have we even allowed this to happen? I mean, I know Barack Obama promised the fundamental transformation back in 2008, and I shuddered. Why do you want to transform something that's good already? But what are you talking about here? I don't believe Barack Obama believes that we ever had anything good going on here in this country any more than the governor of New York, Mr. Cuomo, said when President Trump started talking about make America great again, Cuomo said, eh, America was never that great. This is a shared ideology among the new breed of Democrats in our country. Like you said, this is not the old line liberals that we're talking about who stood for civil liberties and free speech. This is not the party of Robert Kennedy or John F. Kennedy. This is a new extremely radical line of the Democratic Party led by people like AOC, Ilhan yeah. Omar, Rashida Tlaib, the younger crowd who are seizing power, grasping it violently with violent speech. And they have a virulent hatred for everything that America stands for, its history, its republic. They want to do away with the Electoral College so that a few large cities on the east and west coast, along with Chicago, can basically pick the president. They want the Green New Deal, which would outlaw, phase out, whatever you want to call it, all things American, including the history. That's why we see the tearing down of the monuments. That's why we saw when Nancy Pelosi came out against Ilhan Omar's anti-Semitic statement. Mm -hmm. It seemed like at first she wanted to do the right thing and denounce Ms. Omar for these extremely hateful comments about Israel and American Jews. Remember saying it was all about the Benjamin yes. baby and stuff like that. Well, who came to her defense? It was CARE and the Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. folks. Linda Sarsour, yes. who is the mouthpiece of the Brotherhood right now in the U.S., the, the face of it, if you will. She's not the one making the decisions. Those are in the background. But she is the public face 
currently, and she's made a long Facebook post and said that Pelosi is, quote, a typical white feminist doing the work of powerful white men, unquote. I want to quote you again here, Leo. And I'm actually, I'm quoting from some articles, folks, and you can find them at his website, leohoman.com. I'll spell that later for you. But here's what you say. You say, they decide what is acceptable political speech in Washington, and the corporate media backs them up with nonstop propaganda. They will increasingly be coming after after us, the people of conservative Judeo-Christian values in the months and years ahead, trust me, these folks do not play nice. They are coming for our jobs, our businesses, our guns, our cars. They're even coming for our children with state-run daycare for infants and toddlers, those who cannot terminate. They will indoctrinate. And then you say, now going back to some of these representatives in Congress, so when a young freshman congresswoman named Ilhan Omar came out with repeated anti-Semitic statements calling Israel Israel evil and stating those of us who support Israel's right to exist are somehow under the influence of dual loyalties and cannot be trusted. She was speaking directly from the culture she was brought up in. Okay, Leo, Representative Omar is in my area. Her district is 5th District in Minnesota. You know, she's duly elected. So how would you fix the problems that we're talking about? Well, the only reason that she's duly elected is not because of any organic growth of far-left, jihadist-sympathizing people in Minnesota. That's not Minnesota. The reason that she is duly elected is because the U.S. government has been pumping Somali refugees right. into Minnesota for the last 35 years, thereby creating a nation within a nation, a parallel society that is now maturing and getting large enough to elect its own like-minded leaders. And now we see another in the form of Ilhan Omar. Right. To really stop this, people say that she shouldn't be in Congress. Well, she is, and there's no way to remove her because she's duly elected. And the only way that we can stop others from being duly elected would be to stop or severely rein in this refugee resettlement program. And by the way, a major Islamic figure, his name is not coming to me, but he's affiliated with CARE, came out a few weeks back and said that Their goal is to have 35 Muslim congressmen, I believe he said, by the year 2030. On behalf of CARE, Council on American-Islamic Relations, I would like to welcome everybody tonight to our congressional reception, honoring our three Muslim congress members. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Usually, about 40 to 40 American Muslims run for public office. In the past two years alone, More than 270 American Muslims ran for public office in an unprecedented number. 131 of them won seats at this local, state, and federal level. The American Muslim community would spend about half a million dollars giving contributions to candidates that they like. In the past two years, the American Muslim community has spent $18 $18 million to support candidates that support their issues. So it gives me great honor and pleasure to introduce to you our representative, Andre Carson. It's more than just about having three Muslims in Congress. I think symbolically it has great value. But I won't rest until 2020. We have five more members in Congress. 2022 and 24, we have 10 more Muslims in Congress. In 2030, we may have about 30, 35 Muslims in Congress. Then we're talking about Madam Chair Rashida. We're talking about Madam Chair Ilhan. Hell, we could be saying Speaker of the House Ilhan, Speaker of the House Rashida. Senator Rashida, Governor Ilhan, President Fatima, Vice President Aziza, inshallah. Yeah, Andre Carson, there you have it. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't remember who it was that said it, but my numbers were correct. 30 to 35 Muslim congressmen by the year 2030. That is enough to create a voting block in the Congress, 30 to 35 Muslims. Think of what impact this would have on the U.S. support for Israel alone. I'm thinking of it right now. It is 
scary. Yeah. Yes, Jane. Well, I'm quoting you again. This is an article, and it's actually titled The Red-Green Axis of Evil. You can find it at leohoman.com. And you say, these are the values that underpin our Constitution, yet the U.N. has an agenda for us that seeks to undermine our Constitution. How will they do it? They'll do it by opening the borders, introducing anti-Western, anti-Christian ideologies, and socialist economic programs like the Green New Deal, which is nothing more than the U.N.'s failed 20-year program for sustainable development. And then you say, Leo, just reading another paragraph, a part of that agenda to remove borders and boundaries between nations is the refugee resettlements. The globalists understand that demography is destiny, and the best way to establish global socialism is to insert dependent third-worlders into Western democracies who have no intention of assimilating. This creates a parallel society, a nation within a nation, and you say I've documented all of this in their own words in my book. And again, folks, that book is Stealth Invasion Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. Find it at leohoman.com. Go ahead, Leo. Absolutely. And we just see one what seems like stupid comment after another by Ilhan Omar. It seems like she puts her foot in her mouth talking about Judeo-Christian culture being silly. She mocked the U.S. involvement in her country, Somalia, back in 1993 with the Black Hawk Down Mm -hmm. incident. She said that Israel has hypnotized the world with its evil ways. These really aren't stupid, and they are not just off-the-cuff comments. I believe that all these comments by her and Rashida Tlaib are very calculating and planned to get a reaction from people. People who still haven't lost their minds naturally hear these things, Jan, and what is their inclination? They want to criticize them. They want to point out how off-base they are. But then that just gives the Brotherhood, through its mouthpiece care, the chance to slam these people who criticize Omar, criticize Tlaib for their outrageous comments, they are then slammed as being Islamophobic. So it actually, they turn it to their benefit, even though it seems like a stupid comment, it seems like an outrageous comment, it gives the Brotherhood another opportunity to criticize us and make us seem like what they call the white supremacists, Mm -hmm. the white Mm nationalists. They're just being Islamophobic and anti-Muslim. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, if you join me late. This is Jan Markell talking to author Leo Homan. Many of you have read his articles and read his book, and I'll give more contact information as we move along. And also, you say, Leo, we're back to the Democrat Party here. This is not your grandmother's Democrats. They are way more aggressive in pushing their agenda, and they are coming after us. You are no longer just required to tolerate same-sex marriage and transgender bathrooms. You must celebrate the new normal as defined by them. And if you don't, you are immoral and less than human. You may even be a white supremacist as you said, but I want to give another quote of yours here, and that is this. You say, the people who say there is no God, that's most everybody on the left, the people who say there is no God have joined forces with the people who say there is no God but Allah. And that, folks, is a powerful combination. And that's where you get the title, folks, of the Red-Green Alliance, the uh, Red Marxist Green Islamic Access of Evil. And I love that quote, Leo, the people who say there is no God, the Marxists, the leftists, have joined forces with the people who say there is no God but Allah. And that's a powerful combination. You're right, but it's powerfully dangerous. Absolutely. And Jan, what really stood out at me is what you're reading from is the transcript of a speech I gave to my Mm -hmm. local Republican Party here in a county not far from Atlanta. When I started the speech, the first thing I did was ask. It was a group of about 100 folks, county Republican Party meeting, convention. It was their annual convention. And I asked, how many of you have ever heard of the red-green axis? Not a single hand went Really? Not a single hand. And so I said, well, you're using <laughs> some Georgia lingo. I said, well, you're fixing to find out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and they really were shocked by what they heard. They had no idea that the left, the Democrats, the new type of Democrats, not the old Democrats, had so closely aligned themselves with the Islamists in this country that they were both defending each other at every opportunity. Mm-hmm. And you have the left which believes in this country in gradual, creeping Marxism, having the back of the Islamists, which are working for, as you pointed out in that explanatory memorandum, the gradual civilization jihad in which they use our Constitution and the freedom that it grants them to just tear down and wear away at our freedoms, 
just one of which ways in which this works. I pointed out a minute ago how they use outrageous statements and language from these two new Muslim congresswomen to then spark criticism on the half of the right or even the moderates in this country, and then the Muslims jump in with the leftists like AOC and call us bigots. Well, I want to play one more clip because it's still... That is Civilization Jihad. Civilization Jihad. I want to play... process. It's Claire Lopez, a Clarion Project, and again, she's talking about this red-green alliance and how absolutely dangerous it is. Now, there are three major elements, as I mentioned, to this red-green axis, and we're going to talk about each one in turn. The U.S. Muslim Brotherhood, the Black Lives Matter movement, and a communist, anarchist cabal of what I call the Sololinsky mold of anarchists, who are in the tradition, quite literally, of the Russian Revolution of 1917. So we'll start with the Muslim Brotherhood. In the United States, I don't know if, if you all know this, but in 2014, and the Center for Security Policy has written quite extensively about this, including in a book that we call the Star Spangled Sharia, the Muslim Brotherhood front groups, many of them in the United States, formed an umbrella group of a kind. And so I'm talking about CARE, ICNA, ISNA, I'm sorry, not ISNA, they're not part of it, but they're affiliated with it, and other well-known Muslim Brotherhood front groups in this country formed an umbrella group, and they called it the USCMO, United States Council of Muslim Organizations. That group, we thought, was unique to the United States, that only in the United States had these Muslim Brotherhood front groups come together. Lo and behold, we find out in early 2016 that there was a conference held in Crystal City, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., in February of that year, and it brought together the councils, plural, of Muslim organizations from countries all over the world. Represented at that conference in Crystal City were Muslim Brotherhood front groups from see if I can even remember them all. We had Canada, Britain, France, Spain, Germany, Italy, other continents were represented, El Salvador, Brazil were represented, South Africa was represented, Australia was represented, New Zealand was represented, all of those, and I'll add one more in a moment, were at that conference. That means that the Muslim Brotherhood is organized in this way of councils, umbrella groups, not just inside the United States, but they've got a network across the entire world. I hope you see how serious this is, folks. I want to quote Leo Homan one more time here, what he's writing. And he says, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, even Bernie Sanders, none of them matter anymore. The ones to watch are the new revolutionary socialists, the ones who call themselves progressive. All the others are just playing catch up, groveling for support from the socialists who now set the agenda for them. That agenda is above all globalist, socialist, and extending government favoritism to Islam above all others. This agenda is exposed completely in his book. Among all the reviews the book has received, one theme has been dominant. It connects the dots. It helps us understand the values of those taking over the Democrat Party and who want to take over the country. You know, Leo, that's all extremely ominous, and I don't know how to put a positive spin on it. I really don't. Well, the Bible says that this is all going to happen. Jesus said, don't be surprised when they hate you, because they hated me first. At the Last Supper, he told his 12 apostles that they would come under extreme persecution. Eleven of them, all but John, Mm -hmm. I believe, was martyred. Then we can go throughout history and see the same thread, the same trail of blood, of the martyrs. So we should not be surprised. But the silver lining to me is, and we can get into this a little bit later when we talk about the most recent article I posted about what happened in Sri Lanka. Yeah. The way the world responds to this trail of blood from Christian martyrs should bolster our faith because it just affirms what Jesus said. It affirms that we worship the one true God. When you see Muslims being celebrated all over the world, despite the obvious violent nature of this religion, and you see Christians being denigrated when we stand for peace, love, and the golden rule, this just reaffirms what Christ said would happen in the last days 
after he went back to be with the Father. Right, Second Timothy 3 as well, that these days will be perilous times. I want to morph into that other article that we're talking about right now, and that article is titled Elites Setting the Stage for Global Crackdown on Biblical Christianity. Again, that's referencing a couple of things, and certainly the Sri Lanka and before that, it references the situation in New Zealand, but you say this, Leo, and let's talk about it for a few minutes here. You say the same Christophobic war in Christianity will arrive soon in a city near you. Soft persecution has already caused conservative U.S. Christians to lose jobs and be passed over for promotions simply because they are pro-life, believe in the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman, or stand against creeping Sharia in their community. This soft persecution will turn hard soon enough, just as it is turning in formerly free countries like France and Germany. Then you say, are you ready for it? And you and I talked for a few seconds here about this article. It's headed elites setting the stage for global crackdown in biblical Christianity. Let's talk about who the elites are. New World Order people, who are they? Absolutely. These are the folks that are also described as the establishment, the globalists, the elitists, the people who run our university systems, the people who dominate our mainstream media from the very top your CNNs and your MSNBCs, mm-hmm. Washington Post, New York Times, all the way down to most of the smallest daily newspapers in this country. And when I said that we are already seeing the soft persecution, I speak from personal experience because I had a 30-year newspaper career where I worked in mainstream newspapers in suburban areas of Atlanta and Charlotte, North Carolina. After working for four years at World Net Daily, and World Net Daily went into a severe financial crisis and had to lay off most of its staff. I tried to go back into daily newspaper work, and one of the newspapers that I used to work for in 2010 through about 2012 or 13 said, yeah, we want to hire you back. We want you to be our top editor. They offered me the job. I accepted it. About a week later, I get a certified letter in the mail saying, after a recent online review of your work, we have decided to rescind Mm. the job offer. I touched on the forbidden subject. I criticized Islam and open borders. I was no longer hireable even, and this was in a very conservative county in Georgia. Mm -hmm. The publisher actually told me that we are the reddest county in Georgia. So here you have a newspaper in the reddest county in Georgia, which is a red state, and they won't hire someone to be their news editor because he had written critically of Islam and open borders. Okay. It is really going on more than the average conservative is even aware. Right. It is more than the average listener is aware. You're absolutely right. But you and I commented about those who were observing the tragic situation in New Zealand, and then more recently, Resurrection Weekend, of course, what happened in Sri Lanka, and the comments by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Talk to me about that for just a minute. We can carry this over into my second segment. Yes, that was striking, Jan, the choice of words used by Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Julian Castro, Elizabeth Warren. They all used very similar words, and instead of identifying the victims in this tragic bombing, which, by the way, the casualty number is now up to a devastating 359 Mm -hmm. people who were in churches and hotels, They were described by Obama and these others as, quote, Easter worshipers and tourists, and others called them victims and worshipers and people. Nobody on the left, nobody in the mainstream media other than, I believe, Fox News and maybe a couple of other newspapers referred to them as what they were. Christians. Christian. They would use anything but Christian to describe these people. It was really quite astonishing. And Antonio Guterres, the General Secretary of the United Nations, also put out a tweet giving his condolences for this attack, and he refused to call them Christians. And you compare that with the way that these same people responded and reacted to the attack on the two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, and it is stark. All of those responses from these same people, Clinton, Obama, Guterres, said, we stand with the Muslim community. 
We stand against anti-Muslim bigotry. Mm. We want an action plan to stop this Islamophobia. Hillary Clinton used the word Islamophobia. They clearly identified the victims as Muslim, yep. and they identified the attacker as a white nationalist, which this crazy man who did the shooting did make some comment in his manifesto of, about white supremacy, but he also was a big fan of the sustainability and the Green New Deal yep. type of policy. It really is, to me, telling on the difference between these two attacks, one which killed 50, which is bad enough, 50 Muslims, but the other killed 359 Christians. This was the biggest attack, yeah. terrorist attack, since 9-11. Leo, we have to pick this up in the next segment of the programming. Folks, don't go away. I'm coming right back. If Understanding the Times Radio makes a difference in your life and walk with the Lord, let us hear from you. Write us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Or drop us a note at Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Our programming is posted electronically to our website, oneplace.com, and our YouTube channel under Jan Markell on Saturday morning. More with Jan Markell and Leo Holman in a moment. It is now on the horizon, Understanding the Times 2019, Saturday, September 21st. Tickets will go on sale June 1st. They are general admission only and are $25, but include a lunch. After June 1st, we're asking that you call the Brush Fire Agency at 888-338-5338 or sign up online at brushfire.com. That number again is 888-338-5338 after June 1st. We are featuring six speakers and we begin at 8.45 a.m. Church doors open at 7 a.m. And the location is again Grace Church in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, just outside of Minneapolis. Consult our website for hotel information. Our speakers include Dr. Robert Jeffress. These signs that have been around for a long time, they are increasing in frequency and intensity. I think something big's about to happen. Yeah, I believe I we're too. in the last days. I believe the Lord is going to return. Amir Sarfati. And at the last trumpet, we're going to be out of here. There will be certain events around the world, and there will be the last trumpet, and we don't know the day, and we don't know the hour, but we understand the times and the seasons. Pastor J.D. Farag. Because there's coming a time, and I believe it's very soon, when that trumpet's going to sound, and everything here matters no more. I mean, shouldn't that affect us the way we live our lives? Pastor Jack Hibbs. And he's not only spoken to us in his word, he is speaking to us right now in world events. He's requiring you and I to take what we're seeing in the world and match it up against the Word of God. And Jan Markell. I believe that the world is longing for a man with a plan, for a Mr. Fix-It. It says down at the bottom of here, is there a leader who can stop the chaos? We will also have a greeting from Lori Cardoza Moore from Proclaiming Justice to the Nations. The event will be live streamed at no cost. Again, that's Saturday, September 21, just outside of Minneapolis. We invite all remnant believers to better understand the times and become watchmen on the wall. Make friends for life at this annual conference. Learn why things aren't falling apart. They are falling into place. But what they haven't told us in the mainstream media is that over 1,000 Christian churches That's right. have been burned or desecrated or otherwise vandalized over the last year alone. And so this is all being swept under the rug. And when an event is so big that they can't ignore it, like the Notre Dame Cathedral and the attack in Sri Lanka, we're given not the full truth, but just bits and pieces. We have an active website, olivetreeviews.org, that features daily headlines and other articles, video, two years of radio programming, a store with cutting-edge products, conference information, and donate and contact links. You can now text to GIVE 
Jen Markell and Leo Holman are sharing sensitive information this hour. And that's why we ask our listening audience to regularly pray for this ministry and our media team. Also, that we can raise the substantial funding for this radio outreach. Let's return to Jan Markell and Leo Holman to continue their discussion on stealth invasion and resettlement jihad. Fox News alert. ISIS now taking credit for a stabbing attack at a mall in Minnesota. The suspect in St. Cloud was born in Somalia. There's his picture right there on the left-hand side of your screen. Moved to the United States 15 years ago as a child. Police say he's 22 years old or was 22. He was shouting Allah and asking his victims if they were Muslim. So is the Somali refugee crisis now a terror crisis? Fox News contributor, U.S. Army veteran Pete Hegseth lives in Minnesota and has been looking into this and has done stories on this before. He joins us. Mm -hmm. Sadly, Pete, this does not surprise you. No, it doesn't. I was in St. Cloud actually on Saturday, familiar with that community. And if you live in Minnesota, you're familiar with the Somali Muslim population that has grown here, refugees who came here in light of the Civil War there. Minnesota is a very welcoming place. The problem is, is that a lot of those communities have not assimilated the way we would want them to in Rochester, in Minneapolis, in St. Cloud. There's an incubation, there's some radical mosques, there's some radical teachings. And as we've seen from U.S. Attorney Luger, he pointed out very clearly there is a terrorist recruitment problem in Minnesota, and much of the Somali Muslim population is in denial about it. This kid came as a refugee, came as a kid. You can't vet a kid for extremism. Right. The problem is the ideology looks to be ISIS inspired at the very least, uh, as they call him a soldier of the caliphate. So this is a terror problem in Minnesota, and our leaders are nowhere to be found on it. Okay, well, that is part of the discussion that we're having for this particular hour. Let me just quickly say that I know that you lead such terribly busy lives, so remember this programming is posted electronically. Saturday morning, we're airing on about 850 radio stations. If you can't get all of the program, you can get it at olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can get the oneplace.com mobile app and have it downloaded to your devices Saturday morning. Why why don't you look into getting my print and e-newsletter? We talk about these issues in my various newsletters as well. We have an active presence on social media, so look us up there as well. Facebook, Instagram, well, YouTube, and Twitter, as a matter of fact. Now, I'm spending the balance of the program with Leo Homan, and here's how you get a hold of Leo. If you'd like to chat with him, it's leohoman.com. The last name is H-O-H-M-A-N-N, leohoman.com. You'll find his articles, and you'll find his book. And the book is Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. And I've already indicated that Minnesota is certainly, it's sort of a headquarters of some of the issues that we're talking about. I have indicated that I think, speaking as a Minnesotan, the chief issue I think I struggle with is the lack of assimilation of those who are settling here. And the settling of particularly Somalis began, oh, I think it was in the 1990s. It was under President Bill Clinton. And of course, it's only grown exponentially since the 1990s. Leo, we were talking again about the difference in the reaction to the Christchurch bombing couple of mosques in Christchurch. This is now several weeks ago, and comparing it to what happened on Resurrection Weekend a couple of weeks ago now with the Christians in Sri Lanka, you feel this is sort of a foreshadowing of what could become a massive crackdown on biblical Christians on the horizon. We sort of touched on that in the last segment. I think we need to finish our thoughts on that topic before I move to a very related topic. I do, Jan. I do believe something worse is coming. When you see 359 Christians slaughtered while worshiping inside churches on the holiest day in all Christendom, Easter Sunday, and it's already dropped off the news cycle. No coverage of this event, even though the number of casualties kept rising, has continued to rise every day. It was 290. The next day, it was 304 or 5. The day after that, it was 321. By Wednesday night, it was 359. And so even though this is a story that continues to evolve and get worse, you have to really hunt on the internet, you have to go to the internet and start Googling to find out what's going on. We see the same thing happening in France, where we had the big story the week before about what? The burning of the Notre Dame yeah. Cathedral, which is the most iconic church 
in that country, which is quickly being taken over by Islam. 10% of the French population is now Muslim. But what they haven't told us in the mainstream media is that over 1,000 Christian churches That's right. have been burned or desecrated or otherwise vandalized over the last year alone. And so this is all being swept under the rug. And when an event is so big that they can't ignore it, like the Notre Dame Cathedral and the attack in Sri Lanka, were given not the full truth, but just bits and pieces. Sri Lanka, it wasn't Christians, it was Easter worshipers, people, victims, travelers, tourists. When the Orlando Gay Nightclub was shot up a couple of years ago, and 50, I believe it was 49 or 50 people right. died in that tragic event, people like Obama and Hillary were saying what? They said, we stand with the LGBT community. They didn't say, we stand with nightclub dancers. They were very specific in who they said that they were standing with. We don't see that when there's a massive attack on Christians. Right. We just get this vague, generic term like Easter worshipers. Right. To me, that is sending signals. We need to pay attention to the signals that the world is sending us, lest we be caught unprepared when the persecution comes to our country, our state, our city. We don't want to be caught unprepared. This... And I believe that if we read the tea leaves mm -hmm. of what the world is telling us, that there is a hatred for Christianity that is about to boil over. Look at the Nazis. Holocaust. Yep. Jews were not suddenly rounded up and taken overnight, disappearing into concentration camps. First, they had to marginalize them in the media and in the public square. They had to blame them for all the country's woes, the bad economy. It was the Jews' fault. Leo, you and I are kind of talking about biblical Christians here. I want to segue into... I think it will affect all Christians, but it is biblical Christians who are going to be held to the sword. But I'm yeah. morphing into another article of yours, which is really more about apostate Christianity, and it's called The Coming Absolutely. Convergence of Islam and Apostate Christianity. I want to spend an extra few minutes on this because we've got churches participating in all sorts of things that are very strange. Churches participating in Ramadan, churches participating in Chrislam. I'll say more about that as we move into this. You write here, we're back to the situation of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. I'm just skipping around in an article that you wrote, and you say, why were the French so eager to sweep this fire under the rug of history? And then you go on, there has been a disturbing pattern of arsonists, as you just said, targeting hundreds of Christian churches in France over the last few years, including 10 in a one-week period. The same month that the Notre Dame caught fire, there were 10 in one week churches that were burned, probably, I think, by arson. And then you go on to say, with nearly 10% of its population now Muslim, France would quickly devolve into chaos. Police would launch a nationwide manhunt for the Muslim arsonists. Muslims would be out in the streets, perhaps defacing more churches and cemeteries, anything that's stands as a symbol of Christian France, priests and pastors might be kidnapped and killed. Regular Frenchmen feeling threatened might strike back, possibly burning down mosques in retaliation. And then you say, Leo Homan, you say the last thing President Macron wants is to take a chance that a thorough forensic investigation could spark a civil war. You can hardly blame him, but show me a nation that has lost the will for whatever reason to enforce the rule of the law and lost faith in its ability ability to blindly apply justice, and I will show you a nation that has already been conquered. Leo, you say that this situation is setting the stage for the interfaith movement to blossom. What do you mean by that? Absolutely. Just as we see pressure being turned up on biblical Christianity, traditional Christianity, we believe in what? We're pro-life, we don't believe in abortion. We believe in one man, one woman marriage. We don't believe in open borders. There are other Christians that will see the persecution happening before their eyes. And if they're not strong in their faith, maybe they're waffling. Maybe they even believe in some of this stuff they say they do. Maybe they say they're pro-life, but they're going to be afraid because they're going to see the persecution heating up. And the New World Order has an answer. Just go along into this new, watered-down version of Christianity. Maybe it'll be called chris -Law. Maybe it'll be called something else. I don't know. I was shocked. I've heard of the Chris Law movement for several years, but I was shocked when I did an internet search on the word convergence. Islam, Christianity, and convergence. And what I found was a document that came out of a side event 
from the United Nations in 2017 in which they talked about, in very open terms, the coming grand convergence of Christianity and Islam. I was blown away. Quite frankly, and I'm aware of what you're referring to, United Nations Human Rights Council, 34th Ordinary Session, Geneva, the Arab Muslim organizers of this conference conducted under the auspices of Geneva Center for Human Rights Advancement Global Dialogue invited representatives from Muslim and Christian regions to exchange their views on the convergence between Islam and Christianity. I want to move from that to something that happened eh, maybe 10 years ago, because this involves some evangelicals, and that would be the Yale Agreement which kind of morphed into the common word between us and you, as it was called. The Yale Agreement and common word basically said Muslims and Christians worship the same God, all these kinds of things that are just crazy, beyond the pale, that evangelicals would sign on to this, but they did by the barrelful. Representatives from Fuller Seminary, the National Association of Evangelicals, Bill Hybels, North Park University, David Neff, Christianity Today, World Evangelical Alliance, the then president of the Navigators. Again, this is 10 years ago. Uh, Then the religious left, Brian McLaren, Tony Jones, Jim Wallace, these religious leftists all signed this common word between us and you, again, stating the fact that we've got to get along, Christians and Muslims, besides we worship the same God. But you can see how this is morphing, Leo Homan. Yes, absolutely. I was aware of this common word document. They talk about the common word and focusing on what we have in common instead of our differences. That's they right. They talk about building bridges. That's right. The only thing new that I had found last week as I was researching this is this idea of convergence. The title of this document was Islam and Christianity, the Great Convergence working jointly towards equal citizenship rights, and it was co-sponsored by the permanent missions of Algeria, Pakistan, and Lebanon. Well, Pakistan, we know, has a horrific record on human rights with regard to Christians. Lebanon is getting worse by the day, and Algeria is not very good either. So here you have three countries that don't believe in human equal rights for Christians touting some new fangled religion where Islam and Christianity would get together in a great convergence and everything would be hunky-dory. It really is quite astounding. I don't know where it's going from here, Jan, but it's getting to sound an awful lot like a one-world religion. Yeah, one-world religion. And by the way, a real mover and shaker in all that we're talking about, of course, is Pope Francis. He's certainly in the forefront of all the global activity. And you did an article, of course, on the fact that he signed the pact with Islam declaring diversity of religions is willed by God. He's, I think, been called the vicar of the New World Order. So the Pope is a major player. I mean, just what his ultimate role is, I don't know. I'm not suggesting he's playing an apocalyptic role, though he certainly could. I'm quoting you one more paragraph here because we're still in the discussion about the situation in France. And you say, I can't help but wonder if God is trying to tell us something with the tragic fall of the spires of the great cathedral, and that it would be of Notre Dame. That's our current discussion anyway. And you say, like France, we in America know that our Christian house is on fire, or at least smoldering under the weight of sin and moral decay. Will we wait like France until it burns and crashes to the ground, and even then remain in denial, all because we could not bear the thought of calling on the heavenly fire chief to put out the flames? I appreciated that paragraph that you wrote there, Leo. Do you want to expound on that? Yeah. I don't know who set the fire that burned the spire and that caved in the roof of Notre Dame in such dramatic fashion. But I and many other writers, Christian writers, did see it as highly symbolic. It's almost as if we're seeing Western civilization, which is based on Judeo-Christian values, burning and crashing to the ground before our very eyes. And it's a warning from God, I believe. Do we have enough time to turn things around? Will we have the spiritual fortitude to do the spiritual heavy lifting, the repentance, the evangelizing that it will take to turn things around? I don't know, but the warning is there, and it's right before our eyes, and I think the Lord is saying, time is running short. It's time for us to take on a sense of urgency. I I haven't seen a lot of urgency among too many folks in the Western democracy, certainly not any of those who are in political office. There is a remnant who I believe 
is very much aware of what's going on and is preaching repentance and is looking at their own lives and repenting and trying to get right with God because something is getting ready to happen. The Lord is merciful and he's sending us warnings. You can learn more, folks, at Leo's website, leohoman.com, and find his book there, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. Leo, in our time that remains, I want to move to a different topic. I've been covering some information, folks, from his website. He's a journalist. You can sign up for the RSS feed and get it in your inbox every time he writes an article, but you have to go to leohoman.com to do that. And this is an article you've written are you unwittingly funding the leftist takeover of America? Let me just read a couple of paragraphs here, and whatever time we have, we can discuss it just a little bit. You say, many of you have contacted me shocked and asked what we can do to stop the race towards socialism, which we know will accelerate once the progressives win back the White House, and they will win if we continue to ignore the biggest elephant in the room, our lack of funding and the utter dominance of the the mainstream media by the left. When that day comes, it will be open season on anyone who dares to speak up on behalf of Judeo-Christian values that undergird our Constitution. In short, our Constitution itself is in danger of being gutted. And then you say, I know it sounds shocking, but let me repeat what I just said. Much of the money that is flowing into the coffers of evil organizations like Planned Parenthood, the anti-gun lobby, and the far-left community organizing groups originates from the pocketbooks of regular, patriotic, God-fearing American, and some of them Christians. Leo, you go on to talk about just what we're funding. Let's talk about it for the next few minutes here, because my listeners, they're either naively, they're certainly not willingly funding this leftist agenda. We need to tell them just how they are funding the leftist agenda. You go ahead. I'll add to it, but you've got the list here. Absolutely. I believe that every year, in this country, there is a great transfer of wealth from, as you said, conservative, God-fearing, patriotic Americans to those on the far left. And the way that this happens is money is given by these conservative families to mainstream institutions that perhaps were not so far left back when someone who's 50 or 60 years old today and has a kid in college was not so far left back when that 50-year-old was in college. Same with things like, let me just give a few examples. The AARP, it has an annual budget of $1.5 billion and supports liberal causes too numerous to mention, as I say in this article. It puts considerable clout behind Obamacare and the socialization of our medical system and countless other liberal causes, yet people I know, good conservatives, belong to the AARP because what? They get a few discounts here and there. Well, I found half a dozen alternatives to AARP that also give discounts, but don't support. They're either neutral or they support conservative causes. There's a link in my article where you can find them. Girl Scout cookies Mm -hmm. and the Girl Scouts in general. This used to be an all-American patriotic organization, right? Same with the Boy Scouts. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Those girls you see outside of Walmart, selling cookies, those adorable girls in the Girl Scout uniforms. It's hard to say no to them, but I think we need to start saying no to them because that organization is now a supporter, provides support to Planned Parenthood, unbelievably. And we know the Boy Scouts is all into the LGBTQ issue. What about universities? I believe Christians should look at the university that their high school student is interested in and say, does this institution support my values? Or does this institution support the overthrow of Western civilization through creeping Marxism? Mm -hmm. I believe this now includes most public universities, sorry to say. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford to send your child to a Christian university, maybe you should consider other alternatives. Mm -hmm. What about Hollywood? Look at all the movies we go to every year, many of them with a far-left agenda, and yet we see alternatives. We see wonderful Christian-made movies like Unplanned coming out, that are professionally made and support godly values. Let's support them instead of the R-rated and PG-13 Hollywood studio films. 
we have one after another. It was too many really to list in this article, but I did give a list of 38 companies and nonprofits that donate directly to Planned Parenthood. Many of them are household names like mm-hmm. Coca-Cola and Ford Motor Company, Starbucks. The list goes on and on. There, How many places sell coffee? Why should we go and give our money to Starbucks when we know that some of it ends up being donated to far-left foundations and other political organizations that we don't agree with? I call them wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. It's something we really need to consider if we're serious, Jan, about this culture war, which it seems like we're losing. It really is all about the money. Follow the money. The title of the article that we're discussing is, Are You Unwittingly Funding the Leftist Takeover of America? Leo, we haven't even talked about the search engine industry, which, of course, is dominated by Google. There are some other options. I have not found them to be the most effective. Everyone's pouring their time and money in the ads that are coming from Google, and you also reference Amazon. Honestly, Leo Holman, I deal with authors. Their books are published and distributed by Amazon, and I'm going to catch 22 because that's sort of their publisher, and some of them are very, very fine books. And if they're not published by Amazon, Amazon is selling them. But again, owned by leftist billionaire Jeff Bezos, and Amazon has wiped out much of its competition. Are there some alternatives for the products we buy? Maybe we spend a few extra dollars and go elsewhere. I'm not sure, but I wanted to throw those two out options in there that we're all kind of visiting on a regular basis, Google and Amazon. Absolutely. And the one that I had found that is a really good alternative, to me it's far better than Google, Mm -hmm. is DuckDuckGo.com. You go to DuckDuckGo, you punch in whatever it is that you want to search, and you get an unbiased list of sources that provide the information that you're looking for. Whereas with Google, if you punch in, say, something on a topic that myself or Robert Spencer or somebody else wrote about concerning, say, Islam or abortion or whatever, our articles are going to be buried like eight or ten pages into the search. This didn't used to be the case with Google. Five years ago, four or five years ago, you could punch in a topic and a story by Leo Homan at World Net Daily would come up in the first page or two if you put in the right keywords. Now you have to almost punch in the exact headline or title of the article to get it within even the first two or three pages. It really is astounding. But DuckDuckGo doesn't do that, and DuckDuckGo also does not track your searches and save your search data like Google does. Well, and you're right, Leo. You say the problem is that the left, while our parents and grandparents slept, quietly hijacked almost every cultural institution in our country. Once purely American groups, and again, we've talked about it, like the Girl Scouts, the AARP, the Chamber of Commerce, and some of the largest church denominations have all flipped in recent years to the point where they are on board with the insane policies of open borders, abortion, special privileges for an ever-increasing cadre of subgroups claiming to be victims, and socialism under the guise of sustainable sustainable development, or as recently rebranded, the Green New Deal. Folks, if you want to learn more, I invite you to visit leohoman.com, and I invite you to look into his book, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement, Jihad. I've got about 30 seconds, Leo, if you want to wrap it up. Yes, I just thank you so much for this opportunity, Jan, and for your wonderful ministry. I really believe that the answer is we need more observant Christians. We have a lot of Christians in this country, and we have a lot of Muslims. The percentage of Muslims who are observant and actually following the Quran and what it says, I believe, is on the rise. The number of Christians who follow and observe what the Bible teaches has been on the decline for years. We need to reverse that, Mm. and that is going to be the answer to our problem. You know, folks, it says in Isaiah 33, 6, that God will be the stability of our times. Politicians never will.